gangster, man. I don't want to watch it. <laughs> 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 you know what's going to happen. You were out of you were out of there so I don't know what this is. I'll take all of laugh. Right. I'll talk to you tomorrow. <laughs> oh my gosh, you were out of there so fast. You're like, nope, I'm not repeating this one. <laughs> no, uh, not for twenty twenty four. The time is now 728, and the board meeting of education meetings come to order. Good evening and welcome to the January 11th, 2024 board meeting. Before we begin, I would like to ask everyone to turn off any wireless communication devices to avoid any technical interference with the microphones and taping of the meeting. A call-in line has been established for the community to hear the meeting interpreted live in Spanish, the number to call is 508-924-5155. Board member Madeline Lasalia Frazier, please announce these in Spanish. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Madeline Lasalle Frazier. Thank you. Se ha establecido una línea telefónica para que la comunidad pueda llamar y tenga acceso a interpretación en español en vivo. El número a llamar es el 508-924-5155. Repito, el número a llamar es el 508-924-5155. For those who are not able to observe now, the meeting is being recorded and can be accessed on the PGCBS YouTube channel for later viewing. Lastly, for recording purposes, I would also like to remind all board members to turn on your microphones when speaking. 2.2, .2, Board Prayer and Pledge of Allegiance, Board Member Boozler Struther, will you please lead us in the Board Prayer and Pledge of Allegiance? O oh God, we pray to administer all that which is just in all educational policies, being ever mindful of your guidance, steer us to wisdom, steer us to action with love, wisdom, and understanding. Amen. 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 Ms. Andeline, please call the roll. Mrs. Adam Safford? Here. Ms. Buda Strother? Here. Mr. Briggs? Present. Dr. Harris? Here. Mr. Jackson? Here. Mrs. Lasaye Frazier? Present. Dr. J. Miller? Dr. Z. Miller? Present. Mr. Murray? Mrs. Rout? Ms. Walker? Present. Ms. Rivera Forbes? Present. Mrs. Mickis Murray? Present. There, there is pre 12 in the affirmative, and there are no, none in the negative. I mean, I'm sorry, we have eight, we have a quorum. We have eight, 12 board members present. Welcome to 2024. <laughs> <laughs> All right, at this time, we will have the adoption of the agenda of the January 11, 2024 Board of Education meeting agenda. So move. Second. It has been moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? Seeing none. Ms. Adeline, please call the roll. Mrs. Adam Safford? Pres um, aye. Ms. Buda Strother? Aye. Mr. Briggs? Aye. Dr. Harris? Aye. Mr. Jackson? Mrs. Lasaya Frazier? Aye. Dr. J. Miller? Dr. Z. Miller? Aye. Mrs. Rout? Aye. Ms. Walker? Ms. Rivera Forbes? Aye. Ms. Megan's Murray?
The question is on approval of the December 14, 2023 board work session meeting minutes. I move that we approve the December 14, 2023 board work session meeting minutes. Second. It has been moved and seconded. Any discussion? Hearing seeing none, Ms. Adeline, please call the roll. Ms. Adams, Mrs. Adam Safford? Aye. Ms. Buda Strother? Aye. Mr. Briggs? Aye. Dr. Harris? Aye. Mr. Jackson? Mrs. Asaye Frazier? Aye. Dr. J. Miller? Aye. Dr. Z. Miller? Mrs. Bout? Aye. Ms. Walker? Aye. Ms. Rivera Forbes? Aye. Mrs. Mickens Murray? Aye. 11. There are 11 in the affirmative, zero in the negative. The motion carries. At this time, we will have the news break. Voting yes for our children. The board recognizes Superintendent House to introduce the news break. Thank you, Madam Chair. We can uh, move forward with the news break. You could sense the excitement as soon as you walked into Duvel High School recently as PGCPS staged its first ever legislative priority day. Just like the Duval students who reach for the sky in the school's aerospace academy, county school officials hope to launch a spirit of cooperation with lawmakers as the jockeying for dollars for school system priorities is about to begin. This is a monumental step. It is, it is letting everyone know that we are interested in working with our legislators. We want to be at the table at the beginning. We want to help them to write legislation. We want to make suggestions. We want to have a give and take so that we all understand the same issues around how to help our students. Unified and informed advocacy for the best interests of the youngsters that you saw before you today. I think it's very important that we're here to uh, support. And today was about uh, being a starting point to partner uh, with our legislators uh, to make certain that over the course of the next 90 days in this legislative session that we have things and legislation on the table, bills on the table that really speak to the needs of children and the community of PGCPS. And it's great to get more insight from PGCPS, you know, uh, the leadership and to understand what they want to see and what their priorities are, what they like what they don't like so it's very important for us to hear that and of course at the county council level you know we want to be a good partner and help to facilitate some of the things that they're looking to do we have a budget deficit so you know we're really going to have to work through some things but we want to make sure that our students are taken care of even in the face of dwindling funds in what will be a tough budget year there is already plenty of goodwill in Marlboro and Annapolis in fact since so many delegates and senators are PGCPS alumni, the request for more money for priorities like special education, vaccination centers, and waived certification requirements for out-of-state teachers, it was like preaching to the choir. That's the joy about Prince George's County. So many of the individuals are, are homegrown and know what the needs are and have gone to bat uh, for several years, several times, and, uh, and we're just wanting to make certain they understand what they can continue to go to bat for. I think this was a model for things that should take place throughout the county, throughout the state, and can be a model for other states. To see some of the work that the young people are doing so that we can see that the investments that we make are worth our time, worth our money and worth our effort. Perhaps the best advocates on Legislative Day were the students themselves who know what they want and how to get it. Um, so I've had most everything I've wanted, also things that I haven't wanted. I've been able to tell my principal, tell teachers, be able to advocate for them, try to get them in the school system so we can have them and they've been coming like true so far. Like Noah's, May the dreams of all 126,000 PGCPS students be on the minds of all Maryland legislators when they cast their votes. This is Dave Zarin reporting. So much. 
At this time, we will recognize an unsung hero. The chair recognizes board member uh, Dr. Juanita Miller. Good evening, everyone. I'd like to quote uh, Tony Robbins, life is a gift and it offers us the privilege, opportunity, and responsibility to give something back by becoming more. Tonight, the unsung partner for Prince George's County Public Schools Board of Education is Mrs. Mary Hopkins Navy, who is a dedicated community servant whose passion for making a difference has shaped her adult life. Beginning her journey as a flight attendant and eventually becoming CEO of her own company, she has always prioritized community interests. As a McDonald's franchise for over three decades, Mrs. Hopkins Navies owns and operates several McDonald's restaurants in Prince George's County, Maryland. Her business provides employment to over 500 individuals. And Mrs., uh, I'm not going to leave out her, par her big partner, uh, Mr. Jerome <laughs> Navies, who has been alongside her uh, in this business. Throughout her career, Mrs. Hopkins Navies has been a dedicated community activist and philanthropist. She dedicated seven years to the Ronald McDonald House of directors, generously supporting two Ronald McDonald houses in the Washington, D.C. area. Her efforts have also facilitated substantial grants totaling over a quarter million dollars for community nonprofits through the Ronald McDonald House Charity. Through a program called Arc Ways to Opportunities, Mrs. Hopkins Navy's always awards annual scholarships to exceptional employees pursuing their college degrees. Additionally, she presents Crossland High School, which is in District 8, principal scholarships each year to deserving high school students. Mrs. Hopkins Navy's actively engages with Prince George's County's youth, participating in the Prince George's County Executive's summer passport experience. She also hires students throughout the school year through an after school and weekend program. Over her 32 year business tenure, Mrs. Hopkins Navies has been a steadfast supporter of schools, churches, and community groups within her trade areas. Countless organizations have sought her support and she has consistently provided assistance to pro projects that fulfill a need. And most recently, Ms. Hopkins Navies was uh, honored by the Bi-County Round Business Roundtable for excellence in service. Ms. Hopkins Navy con Navies continue to empower and uplift women business owners in Prince George's County and throughout oh, the county, is. the country. Her talks on the importance of, quote, minding your business and the entrepreneurial spirit leaves a lasting impact. impact. Mrs. Hopkins Navies, you are Prince George's County Board of Education's unsung partner. Congratulations, and we applaud you. I also like to acknowledge that uh, one thing that uh, Ms. Na Hopkins Navies and her husband have done is they looked at financial literacy, uh, legacy, and when I speak of legacy, her daughter just recently passed all the, all the tests or whatever McDonald's certifications that McDonald's requires. And so we're looking at another future owner of McDonald's. And uh, Miss Navies and her husband run eight McDonald's in Prince George's County, not one or two. And now we might have nine. And this family.
family has a lot of entrepreneurship. We also have, uh, I'm getting that. This is my speech. <laughs> okay, time, time, time. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge uh, Naima Hopkins. Vincent, the principal of Gwen Park. So this family is really community oriented and they give back to us. So with that, I present to you the certificate of recognition uh, as an unsung partner with the Prince George's County Board of Education and our county in general. And I love you. Uh, Jerome and Naima and come on up family. Come on down. to mention Lily and Vincent also. She's the baby of, of the principal. And she's a Prince George County student. Good evening. I just wanted to say thank you. You know, this is such a privilege for me. Um, I do what I do because it's the right thing to do. We talk to our students all the time about the importance of being obedient. I'm just being obedient. God has blessed me well, and I would like to be known as a good steward of what I have received. I also wanted to take this time to welcome our superintendent, I have not had the opportunity to meet you, but I wanted to welcome you to Wakanda. <laughs> yes, you know, I, I, I really do love living, working, and playing in Prince George's County. And whenever I introduce myself or whenever I have an opportunity to have an audience, I always say, this is my Wakanda. Mm -hmm. Prince George's County, I love you all. And so for me, it is just a privilege to be able to give back to something and someone in a place that I love. So thank you all very much. I really appreciate this. I don't take it easily. And for me, it's very embarrassing to get these kind of recognitions because I'm just being obedient. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks again. One, another round of applause for our unsung hero. The report of the chair. Welcome to 2024. This year, we aim to continue our focused accomplishments benefiting our 130 plus thousand students. We extend our thanks to all of our Prince George's legislators, county council members, as well as representatives from the Office of the County Executive, unions, community partners, administrative staff, and adjoining districts, for example, Montgomery County, for attending our first Prince George's County Legislative Day held on December 15, 2023. 
Much appreciation to Superintendent House, Chief of Staff Board, and Board Policy and Governance Chair in his absence because he left us, Walter Fields, for coordinating this amazing opportunity to share our 2024 Prince George's County legislative priorities. We look forward to collaborating and continuing this most important work during the current 90-day legislative session. This month, we also are raising awareness about the importance of screening for cervical cancer. In the United States, more than 11,000 people are diagnosed each year with cervical cancer. Anyone with a cervix at risk for cervical cancer, screening test and the HPV vaccine can help prevent it. While cervical cancer is found early, it is highly treatable and associated with long survival and a good quality of life. This month, let's educate ourselves and others about the steps we can take to protect ourselves and our loved ones from cervical cancer. And finally, I would like to speak a moment about human capital. It is extremely important that we value the employees, the principals, the teachers, our students, the folks in Sasser, our, my fellow board members, because all the work we do is based on meaningful relationships. And I am hoping that this year, that that is the first thing on our list, is to mend and build relationships amongst ourselves. So Superintendent House, I thank you for your, for, your, um, for your talk with your employees. I watched that. I was impressed because you really put in perspective and you really heard from the community and the board members on our priorities because you spoke to them. And I appreciate that. So what I am saying is, we have an opportunity this year to be extremely successful. And I think as long as we can put our differences aside and work collaboratively with, e with each other, we will be successful. So thank you so much. Thank you very much. At this time, we will have a moment of silence to honor the memory of the following Prince George's County staff, family, and community members. Senator Douglas J.J. Peters, 23rd District in Prince George's County and former Majority Leader of the Maryland State Senate. Ashley Hines, former student and 2023 graduate of Dr. Henry A. Flowers Junior High School. Julius Hines, Food Services Assistant, Beltsville Academy. Rosa E. Gunsman, Food Services Assistant, Cesar Chavez, Dual Spanish Immersion. Beverly B. McNeil, Classroom Teacher, Largo High School. Marcus Gonzalez Chavez, Special Education Assistant, Adelphi Elementary. Wanda Butler, Mentor, Teacher, Oxen Hill Staff Development, Office of Professional Learning and Leadership under Division of Human Resources. Tanya Stringfield Howell, Teacher, Blatonsburg High School. Beverly Jo McNeil, Teacher, Largo High School. John S. Van Slyke, Facility Supervisor. Lewis Wilson, Sr., Faculty Facilities Administration Building. Earl Dixon, the second brother of Dr. Ingrid. Mm. Williams Horton, Director of Community Schools. Lutetia V. Ely, paraprofessional, Glenn Arden Woods Elementary. And I'm sorry mm, that I'm getting emotional. 
But that's a long list of our family. That's a long list. So please, let's take a, member, a moment to remember them and their families. Thank you. Please continue to keep these families in your thoughts and in your prayers. Next, we'll move forward with item 2.10, report of the superintendent. I'd like to recognize Superintendent House for his report. Thank you, Madam, uh, Madam Vice Chair, I appreciate it. Uh, as you all know, um, uh, this month, January, marks uh, School Board Appreciation Month. And uh, I wanna take just a moment uh, to say that uh, number one, we understand uh, and I say we, me and my administration, we understand the journey that you all are on uh, in terms of taking on the commitment of being a vessel and a voice uh, for your community. And I thank you uh, for what that looks like. I know how difficult it is, time consuming it is, uh, and uh, it's something that uh, is, is sometimes a thankless, a thankless opportunity and job. So thank you for what you do. January is School Board Appreciation Month. A good time to recognize our 13 dedicated school board members and one phenomenal student member for all that they do to ensure that the success of our students and schools is number one. Members of the Board of Education provide oversight, guidance, and accountability. But most importantly, they are a voice for the families, the students, and the communities that they represent on a daily basis. This service to the Prince George's County Public Schools is invaluable, and I look forward to continued partnership as we work together to build a future of equity, excellence, and endless possibilities. Thank you. Thank you. Mercy. Muchas gracias. Thank you. Thank you y muchas gracias. From the bottom of our hearts, thank you. So just, to, just an update in reference to uh, security enhancements. As you all know, um, uh, this, uh, this school year we, we proactively moved forward with implementing new safety measures that uh, really started with the, the previous CEO and uh, so we've moved those enhancements forward. We're now uh, prepping to launch phase three. Uh, we are uh, in a place where we've uh, finished phase two and are uh, are in each one of our, our high schools, as you can see in that bottom section. Uh, phase three is ahead of us, and we're uh, on pace to, to stay on schedule. As, uh, as this week of, um, uh, uh, you know, starts the, the legislative uh, platform, uh, it has opened, and we're really excited about what it looks like. Um, you know, more than 800 times shared and more than 60 times uh, over. Uh, throughout the legislative session, the platform will continue to serve as a, uh, a roadmap uh, to, uh, to ensure that PGCPS continues to engage with elected officials and shape legislation that, uh, that will impact our community, impact our students, uh, impact us uh, as, a, as a whole. So we look forward to continued advocacy over the course of the next 90 days, uh, that this uh, will be in the best interest of our school district and our students. Now, earlier uh, this month, we put uh, out a, a joint press release alongside the county executive and Chief Aziz with the Prince George's County Police Department to, to really support the recruitment efforts of crossing guards. And it's important that our community knows and understands that there have been some modifications because we wanna put forth an effort to get as many crossing guards out. Uh, there has been a significant shift in the, the pay uh, for crossing guards that moved from $12 and some odd uh, cents to I believe $17 or $18. Uh, they also have changed the age. Uh, it used to be 21 years old. It is now at, uh, at 18 years old. Uh, so on, on January the 17th, our budget office led by our chief financial officer will begin to host a series of, of budget uh, pop-up hosts to, to really seri uh, to really ensure that uh, these workshop builds continued understanding around uh, what happens. As mentioned in the last uh, bubble, February the 1st, we'll begin to uh, focus on phase three of our security rollout. 
which again, we are on pace to, uh, to get where we need to go. Madam Chair and Vice Chair, that concludes uh, my superintendent's report. Thank you so much, Superintendent House. And thank you for recognizing the board, everyone who added into that. It was, it was spectacular. Thank you so much. We'll move to item 211, 2.11, progress reports. We're going to begin with Operations, Budget, and Fiscal Affairs Committee. The Vice Chair would like to recognize board member Shayla Adams Stafford, the Operations, Budget, and Fiscal Affairs Committee Chair, to introduce the progress report. Thank you so much, Vice Chair Walker. Good evening, everyone. For fiscal year 2024, the Operations, Budget, and Fiscal Affairs OBAFA Committee has convened since August 2023. During these meetings in the committee, in conjunction with the PGCPS administration, we have discussed, acted on, and we've been provided with, a th with thorough presentations on the following topics. The OBAFA Committee 2023-2024 Work Plan, Summer 2023 School Construction Projects, Proposed FY25 Capital Budget, FY25 through 30 CIP and Comprehensive Maintenance Plan Recommendations and Updates, the FY24 Capital Improvement Plan and its accomplishments, the FY25 Operating Budget Priorities, Budget Cycle Updates, Community and Board Member Surveys and Results, the FY25 Proposed Operating Budget, Pop-Up Budget Focus Sessions and the Amendment Process, the P3 Phase 2 Blueprint Schools Construction Budget Changes and Updates, Transportation Accomplishments, op Options to Mitigate Bus Driver Shortage, Audit, Software, Communications, Payroll, Hiring, and Labor Partner Updates, First and Fourth Quarter Internal Audit Reports and Audit Plan. The OBAFA Committee is on track to complete our outlined objectives in the Committee's two um, 2023 and 2024 Work Plan and more. Last evening, we hosted one of three inaugural virtual budget-focused pop-up sessions in the southern region of the county. We will host the remaining sessions virtually for the central region on Wednesday, January 24th, and the northern region on Wednesday, February 7th. Be sure to look for the electronic invitation and join in. And the focus of these sessions is to provide stakeholders with more transparency and understanding about the budget process. So we, we invite everyone to join in. For our upcoming budget focus sessions, we're gonna be focusing on safe passages, student activity funds, um, and student activity fund discussions. We're committed, to, we're committed to continuing the work of the board as its designated oversight of the PGCPS operations and budget. The committee is grateful to have been successful in developing and cultivating a wonderful working relationship with the superintendent's designated representatives who regularly attend our meetings. I would like to say a sincere thank you to this awesome team of consummate professionals for their hard work and dedication. Ms. Lisa Powell, our Chief Financial Officer, Dr. Sharaska Coleman, our Chief Operating Officer, Mr. Jason Washington, the Associate Superintendent of Supporting Services, Dr. Christ Christy Baldwin, Chief Human Resources, and Ms. Michelle Winston, the Director of Internal Audit. I would also like to thank my fellow committee members, Ms. Judy Mickens-Murray, Dr. Kenneth Harris, Mrs. Jocelyn Rout, and our student member, Ms. Rain Rivera-Forbes, for following me to lead in your collaboration and support. It's not just our civic duty, but it's an honor to serve with all of you. Thank you, and this concludes my report. Thank you so much, Board Member Adam Stafford. 2.12, Progress Report, Policy and Governance Committee. The Chair recognizes Board Member Jonathan Briggs, Chair of the Policy and Governance Committee. Thank you so much, Chair. Um, the Policy and Governance Committee is charged with facilitating the short and long-range strategic planning for the school system, providing oversight of board policy and legislative and government matters involving federal, state, county, and municipal governmental agencies and officials. The committee shall ensure that board governing policies are current and compliant with federal, state, and county laws and consistent with the best practices in public education. The Policy and Governance Committee members and superintendent representatives are as follows. Mr. Jonathan Briggs, committee chair. Um, Ms. Lolita E. Walker, Dr. Juanita Miller, Ms. Rain Rivera-Forbes, Committee Vice Chair, um, celebrating that, by the way, um, Mrs. Judy Mickens-Murray, ex officio, and Ms. Robin Welsh, Director, PGCBS Office of Government Relations, Compliance and Procedures, Administration Representative. School year 2023-2024 committee meeting schedule. This school year, the committee reviewed and discussed numerous policies to further advance the PGCPS goal of providing excellent education to our students and empowering our communities. The committee has maintained monthly meetings since August 22, 2023. 
the school year 2022-2023 committee work plan in progress. Uh, the committee's approved work plan for the 2023-2024 school year was confirmed at the August 22nd, 2023 committee meeting and was later brought to the board in their October meeting. The committee continues to focus on the recommendations received from the board and superintendent for board policies that require review due to legal ramifications, citation corrections, rescissions, and cycle updates, and to be in alignment with existing administrative procedures to be enacted. The status of the recommended policies based on the work plan are as follows. One, board legislative uh, platform completed. Two, 15 policies currently under review and 21 policies left to be reviewed for the school year. Um, and the committee will continue to work on reviewing, updating, and enacting policies per policy 9340, policy development, in the utmost interest of our stakeholders, PGCPS students, employees, and the community. Thank you so much, Chair. Great, thank you again. So the Policy and Governance Committee uh, met virtually and discussed the revisions to the following policies. Board Policy 0105, Parent, Family, and Community Involvement. Board Policy 0117, Information Technology Services, Information Security. Um, board Policy 9250, Attorneys. And Board Policy 5116, Appeals Process of Student Transfer Requests, which is a rescission. Um, the purpose of policy 0105, parent, family, and community involvement, is to establish the framework and responsibilities for the implementation of the strategies to provide a more responsive and inviting school climate and increase the level of parent, family, and community involvement in PGCPS. The purpose of policy 0117, information technology services, information security, is to promote cybersecurity in all PGCPS electronic communications, data, and information assets and accountability for PGCPS. The purpose of policy 9250 attorneys is to provide guidelines for the board to retain counsel to represent it in legal matters and to defend a board member who is involved in litigation because of their service on the board or in the member's official capacity on the board. And finally, the purpose of policy 5116, appeal process of student transfer requests, which is a rescission, was that if the Office of Student Transfer denies a transfer request, the parent or legal guardian uh, that is constituted as a legal guardian may appeal the decision in writing to the Office of Appeals, which serves as the designee of the superintendent. The committee voted unanimously to have these policies be forwarded to the full board with the recommendation that it be approved to seek public comment. And finally, um, policies with the recommendations to be advanced as first reader. The Policy and Governance Committee met virtually and discussed the public comments on the following new policies which include professional development. The purpose of this policy is for board members to provide, to provide guidelines for the types of professional development board members are required to complete and to schedule for the completion of the professional development. Um, after the discussion, the committee voted unanimously to forward the policy to the full board with a recommendation that they be approved as first reader. Thank you so much, Chair. Thank you. Do you want to make the motion? For your policies to move forward? Yes, I um, move to um, forward the policy. Um, that we approve the policies for first reader. Right, uh, yeah, I move numbers. that we approve the policies for first reader. Thank you so much. <laughs> With the numbers. Uh, yes. Give me the numbers. Excuse uh, me, Chair McKiss Murray. Cool, that should be just for public comments. First reader is item 7.0. I was listening to him and he's. He said two things. He said public comments, and then the, the other one was first reader. Am I correct, Mr. Riggs? Yeah, so the first set of uh, recommendations were for public comment, and then the second was for first reader. Okay, we need to do two motions, one for the public comments and one for the first reader. Okay. Please. Madam Chair, point now of information. Oh, okay. Uh, board member uh, Routh. Thank you so much. Um, I believe uh, this is on our, it's not on our agenda. No, I know. So, I'm let, please let Mr. Briggs make the motion for the policies. And give me the numbers, please, sir. Okay, so I move to approve the following policies for public comment. So policy 0105, parent, family, and community involvement. Policy 0117, Information Technology Services, Information Security. Policy 9250, Attorneys. And Policy 5116, Appeals Process of Student Transfer Request. For Thank you. 
So, uh, board members, there's a motion on the floor to approve policies 0105, policy 0117, policy 9250, policy 5116 to move forward for public comment. Is there a second? Second. Okay, it has been moved and seconded. Any questions? Seeing none, Ms. Adeline, would you please call the roll? Mrs. Adam Safford? Aye. Ms. Buddha Strother? Aye. Mr. Briggs? Aye. Dr. Harris? Aye. Mr. Jackson? Mrs. Asaya Frazier? Aye. Dr. J. Miller? Aye. Dr. Z. Miller? Aye. Mr. Murray? Mrs. Rout? Abstain. Ms. Walker? Aye. Ms. Rivera Forbes? Aye. Ms. Mickens Murray? Aye. There are one, two, three, four. 12 votes in the affirmative, one abstention. The motion carries. There's only 12 things to me. So it's 11 and 1. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. 11 and 1. I have 12. There's only one member missing, and that's Murray. Well, this is not here. Not here. Well, and he's not on my list. Board members, please raise your hand so that I can count uh, the board members that voted in the affirmative. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. There are eleven in the affirmative and one abstention. Okay. Now, Mr. Your second motion for yep. the first so I moved reader. to approve the following policy for first reader. Um, it's a new policy and it's professional development for board members. Okay. No, no policy number. Oh, we don't have a policy number. No. Okay, so the motion is on the floor to approve pro a professional policy for board members as a first reader. It's under 8.3. Any, it's been moved and seconded. Any questions? It's, it's under 8.3 for voting. You're just moving it up. He moved them up with his uh, reporting that's what happened so that's what happened you went out of order but it's okay you know it's 2024 we're gonna make adjustments all right so board mayor there's a motion on the floor second, Did we second? second. it's been moved and seconded to approve professional development for board members uh any questions hearing none seeing none all in favor uh miss adeline please call the roll and for correction we approving item 8.3 8.3, yes. Thank you. Mrs. Adam Safford? Aye. Ms. Buddha Strother? Aye. Mr. Briggs? Aye. Dr. Harris? Aye. Mr. Jackson? Aye. Mrs. Lasaya Frazier? Aye. Dr. J. Miller? Abstain. Dr. Z. Miller? Aye. Mrs. Rout? Abstain. Ms. Walker? Aye. Ms. Rivera Forbes? Aye. Ms. McKinsbury. Aye. Ten in the affirmative, two abstentions. The motion carries. Thank you. This is your first night as chair, so we understand and we'll help you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, the board. Let us, legislative agenda. The chair recognizes again Chair uh, Briggs to report on the Maryland Association of Boards legislative session. Great, thanks update. so much, Chair. Um, so the May 2024 legislative session will include uh, uh, priority funding and policy issues such as annual state budget and education funding, tax revenues, um, local blueprint funding and accountability, artificial intelligence, capital budget and construction, um, school construction and pre-file bills. Um, in fiscal 2025, uh, the public schools are expected to receive an estimated total of $9 billion in state aid, which represented a 4.5% increase over fiscal year 2024. Of this amount, $8.1 billion will flow directly to local school systems. Total funding changes are largely attributable to projected changes in student enrollment and greater per people funding amounts of major aid programs. There will also be overall funding for Blueprint for Maryland's Future programs, uh, totaling $705.8 million in fiscal year 2025, an increase of 25.7% over 
over fiscal year 2024. And finally, the structured deficit of $761 million is forecast for fiscal year 2025, and it's projected to increase to $2.7 billion by fiscal year 2029. Additionally, MAVE will be hosting a, um, a legislative day reception that will take place Monday, February 5th, 2024, from 5 to 7 p.m. MAVE's 2024 Legislative Day Reception will provide a prime opportunity to discuss MAVE's 2024 legislative priorities and engage in lively discussions about lawmakers' uh, perspectives and positions on education funding and other core policy issues. The Speaker of the House, Adrian A. Jones, will be speaking, and they will also have, and they've also invited the Governor um, and Senate President Bill Ferguson and Interim State Superintendent of Schools, Dr. Kerry Wright. Um, so wanted to share that, board members, it, if you can attend and we can be there to kind of uh, coordinate around our, our specific policy agenda, which is also available for the public on our website, uh, we would love for you to kind of stay tuned on that. Um, back to you, Chair. Thank you so much. At this time, we will have uh, the public comment and non-agenda items. The Chair recognizes the speakers of the public comments on agenda and non-agenda items. The board will recognize your comments but will not address them. Registered speakers have three minutes to make their presentations and may not relinquish any part of their speaking time. Speakers may not address individuals or issues with profanity or derogatory terms. You will be warned once. If you continue, your comments will be muted and you may be removed from the meeting. Speakers are encouraged to use titles rather than names. For example, chair board member, superintendent, principal, etc. There are nine public speakers tonight. Our first speaker is Joseph Jakarta, Climate Parents of Prince George's County, Clim Climate Action Committee. You see here? Oh, okay, I was just told that he submitted something in writing to the board, thank you. Okay, next we will have Terry Johnson, Individual Situational Awareness. Okay, bear with me. I'm very nervous. My name is Ter my name is Terry Johnson. I've been working for Prince George's County for 15 years. I am an IT person. Okay, um, I am a breast cancer survivor. I had a tumor this big, and they had to shrink it so they um, to get it out. And I had a bad reaction on chemo. Um, I'm sorry, I lost my information. I'm sorry. Um, I started in IT at FDA. I trained doctors and scientists and chemists and Dr. Fossey at NIH how to use Windows 95, how to transfer the data, and how to use a mouse. And from there, I had, when I was working at FDA, I did have an FBI clearance. Um, and I also went to school. I am A plus network, Dell certified, MAC certified. The reason why I'm telling you this, management asked me, would I train the students at Furman High School to teach them how to pass the A-plus test, and which I did. I taught them how to pay, uh, pass the test. Also, I fed them and everything. And the reason why I'm coming to you is that, and also I worked on the Gate Squad, and the reason why I'm coming to you is that the job that I have, and I went to school when I was in California. I did all my certifications in California. Um, I lost my job because management does not like me. Um, I had a compassion from computers. Not only I built computers, I had a little companies. I taught ch children how to use computers. 
I also worked on a network. I had to cut wires. When I was first in FDA, I was the only woman. They did not want, want women on the computer team. And the reason why I've come to you here today to explain to you how I abused from management. Um, they did not want me on the team when I came back. The new management told me that he did not want me on his team. For a whole year when he was my management, he supposed to did an evaluation. He supposed, I was supposed to email him every day and call him every day, which he never did respond to me at all until I came back on work and then he hollered and started screaming. He threatened me. Thank you. Oh, uh, my finish your, Yes, finish your last statement. Finish your last sentence. You, you may finish your last sentence. I'm sorry. Just, just finish your last sentence. That's okay. If, if you can send us a copy, the, the ladies in the office will send it to us, okay? Okay. Thank I you. Really I appreciate that. Thank you so much. Our next speaker is uh, Timothy Meyer. Mount Rainer Elementary PTO, Safe Routes, Progress, and Next Steps. Good evening, everyone. Before the break, I shared efforts on safe routes to schools, and I wanted to give a recap and some updates. Parent leaders have built a coalition of 11 schools with more than 8,000 PGCPS students, then expanded it, adding climate parents of Prince George's County, the Washington Area Bicyclist Association, Bike Maryland, and other groups. Municipalities like Mount Rainier, Brentwood, and Greenbelt took action in support of our efforts. To everyone who has joined us, thank you. Parents and community leaders spoke, and County Executive also Brooks listened. She deserves thanks, and our door is always open to work as partners. Her emergency action is a good first step, but it's only the beginning. Some schools report that they still lack coverage. To really fix this, we need greater transparency, a public database of crossing guard locations so parents can better know the safest routes to school and track vacancies. I've worked with a lot of media over the past month. Every story has focused on crossing guards, and yes, they are essential, but they're the bare minimum in a fight that's so much bigger. The goal is not to make a few intersections safer. It's making sure every step from the front door to the classroom and every street and sidewalk in between is safe. Anything less is failure. So what's next? District 22 has a stop sign camera bill that is must pass and a top priority. We still need a dedicated county task force to work on long-term solutions and fundamentally rethink public policy and street design around our schools. This is not a one or two month issue. PGCPS can lead with safe passage plans for every school and a countywide safe routes coordinator. And let's go after every state or federal dollar we can to make it happen. In Mount Rainier, our work continues. A lower citywide speed limit takes effect next month. We just won $9.7 million in Safe Streets funding. And our PTO has a major announcement on a new Safe Routes project coming in the next week or two. We urge others to do as much as you can. And I'll work with any school or municipality in the county to help. None of this will be easy. But this is a county and a board that is built to do big things. PGCPS proud is more than a phrase. It's who we are. Chair Chairwoman Mickensbury is right, and there's been a shift in tone on this board. The board has grown. The past is the past, the mission ahead is clear, and it's a new year. So thanks to each of you, and let's continue this important work together. Thank you all very much. Thank you so much. Our next speaker is Tanya Wingfield. Citizens of Accountability and Governance, policy, uh, Board Policies and Accountability. Happy New Year. Happy um, New Year. If the professional development 
um, outlined in the unnumbered policy, is it, if that's going to increase the $1.8 million spent on this board, citizens, citizens of accountability and governance, we do not support this effort. Um, we are facing a budget deficit and the staff development of board members who have campaigned that they are ready to serve on this board is not a necessity. Policy 9250, that could potentially be a violation of due process rights. If this board hires an attorney and then you're dealing with a case where the board is the petitioner or the appellate and the board member is the respondent, how can an attorney represent both parties to a different claim? I can't see any attorney in their right mind taking on that conflict. Also, this policy says that it, during the course of litigation, if that board member acted appropriately, the board fees would be paid. My question is who pays for the attorney fees until they get into litigation? Also, it, you may want to look at those definitions and look at the Maryland Code of Regulation um, 13A.01.05, uh, which gives the correct definitions of the parties. Uh, they're not plaintiffs and defendants. They're appellates and petitioners and respondents. I should know I filed enough of them. <laughs> and um, when they go into the circuit court, they continue with that title. So, um, you know, by and large, the policy committee, y'all do a great job, but on this one, you need to go back to the drawing board. I want to thank the administration for rescinding the uh, closure of Point and Ridge and listening to the community. And then finally, the board chair has committed forgery and theft by approving the payment of over $40,000 in legal fees, knowing she does not have the signature authority, read policy 0107, and authorizing the board council to represent three board members to the point that he lied in open court telling the judge <coughs> that this board told him to participate when it was only the chair. Shame on this body minus one person, because you've been getting this information since August, and he's still sitting here, and taxpayer dollars are being wasted. You have not honored your fiduciary responsibility. So, we will be looking for candidates with the courage and integrity of the former chair of this board to fill your seats. Good night. Thank you. Our next speaker, Dr. Donna Christie, PGCPEA, Administrative Efficiency and Effectiveness. And I'm joined uh, with uh, ASASP as well. I'm Dr. E. Okay. Carlene Murray. Okay. Good evening, esteemed school board members, colleagues, and community stakeholders. I am Dr. Donna Christie, President of the Prince George's County Educators Association. Today, we stand before you to bring to light the chronic systemic issues impeding the efficiency and effectiveness of our school district's operations, particularly in human resources, absence management, certification, and payroll. The recent findings of the quarter one audit that will be presented in this board meeting substantiate what we at PGCA and ASASP have been voicing concerns about for some time. The report indicates falsified time records, improper payroll practices, and issues surrounding teachers' compensation and administrators' compensation, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> especially concerning their roles in covering classroom vacancies. Such revelations are alarming, but not surprising. Payroll discrepancies were a significant concern in two out of four school investigations included in the report. This is not just an administrative error, but a systemic issue affecting the hearts of our education system, our teachers and staff. Th these discrepancies have real life impacts, causing financial strain and uncertainty for those who dedicate their lives to educating our youth. The audit's findings echo the concerns of the labor partners have attempted to address in our labor partner meetings and through individual grievances. We have consistently highlighted the understaffing and under-resourcing of key departments like HR, payroll, and data quality. These departments are crucial for the smooth functioning of our schools and the welfare of our employees. Our teachers and staff are the backbone of our education system. 
When they are burdened with administrative inefficiencies and uncertainties about their compensation, it directly impacts their ability to provide the high quality education our, service, our students deserve. Therefore, I urge the board, we urge the board, yes, <laughs> to take immediate action. We must strengthen our internal systems by ensuring that departments like HR and payroll are adequately staffed and resourced. We must implement robust checks and balances to prevent payroll discrepancies and time record falsifications. Additionally, investigating, investing in technology and training for better data management will go a long way in resolving these chronic issues. Our educators and administrators, as administrators and educators, yes, <laughs> sorry, okay. we, our collective goal is to foster an environment where learning thrives. However, this is only possible when our teachers and staff are supported and their operational needs are effectively met. We appreciate your attention and look forward to working collaboratively to find sustainable solutions to benefit our entire education community. And with a few seconds left, I want to say thank you to our board chair for her heart and humanity that she showed this evening in reading um, the list of those that we've lost. Um, our our students, our faculty are all dealing with a lot of grief and trauma. Yeah. This year, it's been the most challenging year. Our particular heart's out this evening to the family of flowers. Um, and I know, I think Belief Central is now also impacted by that, those events. Um, it's been a difficult year for all of us. And so thank you for showing your heart and humanity this evening. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Nakisha Fowler, Maryland Jaguars Track and Field Booster Club. Good evening, thank you for the opportunity to speak with you all. My phone just went upside down. Um, our track team went on a trip to New York this past uh, weekend on January the 5th, and due to inclement weather, we, the, the track team was asked to come back on January the 5th, uh, even though the activities were canceled on the 6th. So we reached out to the school board on the 5th, didn't get a response, reached out to the AD's office, didn't get a response. This incident has raised some questions that we would like to bring to the board. The first is um, we are being mandated to use Globetrotters for all of our travel. Globetrotters has not um, no. been consumer friendly. They do not respond in a timely fashion, which puts, puts our travel at, in jeopardy. We were unable to get what we need for our team for this trip. Um, because of the cancellation called in by the inclement weather, we lost or have potential to lose close to $10,000, which are the costs for travel, lodging, and event costs. We are asking that, is there travel insurance through Globetrotters? If so, we would like to find out what we need to do to file a claim. If not, we want to know what the school board intends to do to help us recover those costs. Also, we would like you all to consider um, canceling, reevaluating your contract with Globetrotters. Um, I think that's about it. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much. <laughs> Our next speaker is no Nicole Jean Philip Philippi, I think, um, individual kindergarten students access to YouTube. And pronounce your last name for me. It's Nicole Jean Philippe. Okay, thank you. Yes. Hi. Good evening, everyone, members of the school board and the CEO. Thank you for your time tonight. My name is Nicole Jean Philippe, a concerned mother of a seven year old attending school in the PGCPS school district. I'm here to urgently address the safety of our elementary school children online, specifically their access to and use of YouTube. Before diving into the details, I would like to highlight that I did share a pre recorded video which graphically demonstrated the issue I speak to tonight. Ironically, however, shortly after its submission, I received a call from the board stating that the video could not be shared in this forum due to the inappropriate nature of the content. It's unfortunate how it's deemed passable for my seven-year-old and others, but not for the adults in this room. Let's first address YouTube's age policy, which requires its users to be at least 13 years old. Yet children as young as five access the platform on school premises without supervision and without my consent. Since my inquiry to the board, district and charter school, my child attends, the CIO, who has been very kind, um, worked with CLF Charter to add the elementary internet filter, in quotes, to our students' devices. 
This change took place as of January 3rd. However, as recently as today, I searched Roblox and found very graphically violent content and searched My Little Pony and was presented sexually explicit content. The video I was not allowed to share with you all here was evidence of this. On multiple occasions, I have requested clarity regarding what percentage of the curriculum requires the direct use of YouTube by elementary students to complete their classwork. Having this information would help us understand why the district seems so bent on maintaining this connection. I honestly don't recall this very unhealthy dependency being an issue prior to COVID-19. Recent changes to YouTube's platform have made filtering content nearly impossible, exposing our children to this incredibly dangerous content. Additionally, the platform's algorithm recommends inappropriate videos alongside child-friendly material, making it challenging to ensure a safe online environment. While several recommendations have been made to remove YouTube from my scholar's device specifically, this is an impractical non-solution. As my initial inquiry began, based on what another student shared with other classmates that included my child. In November 2023, other school districts across the nation have faced similar issues and opted to remove YouTube from direct students access, a step that high schools here in the DMV area have also taken, high schools. Maintaining YouTube accessibility for our students violates the Federal Children's Internet Protection Act. To, privatize, to prioritize our students' safety, the only viable option is to block YouTube from all students' devices, excluding teachers. Many concerned parents, including myself, have signed a petition urging the school board to find alternative secure platforms, balancing educational value with student safety online. I implore you to change the rules on this, and I have included a pre-recorded video in my notes. Thank you. Could you leave your um, your uh, papers with one of those yes, ladies, please? I will. And thank you. Could could you ladies see that we each get a copy, please? Thank you. Um, next, we have Miss Phyllis Wright, individual cleaning of schools. Good morning, board members. Welcome back. Happy Good New evening. Year to you all. I'm here for two reasons. I'm a proud parent of two schools here in Prince George's County, and I need to talk about both. I went to William Hall Academy for an event. When I walked in the building, the building was filthy. The, the acting principal was not there on this event where um, hundreds of families was there to see their child perform. I went back the next day and I took pictures of what I saw the day before because I was hoping maybe they would clean it that night or the next day. When I went back the next day, the problem was still there. I sent you all emails of the pictures and I hope you all got it and thank you for your response. Um, Dr. House for responding back to uh, my concerns. I have the pictures, number one, that's for William Hall Academy. We do not have a vice principal there. We have an acting principal there who's so afraid to talk and ask for help because of the, the ties that you all have on them. We need help for that gentleman over there. We need a team. Dr. Golson had sent me a team in there just before COVID and cleaned this building before. And if you see these pictures of what is going on in these schools that you all have our children sitting in, this filth, and I think it's very unacceptable. I'm gonna leave that right here to I'll give it to her. I'll give it to you. Um, you have the email. Um, they told me that the trash bags cost $20 so they couldn't get any more. I couldn't understand why they were using trash bags and why they're not cleaning up. Flowers High School. I have a daughter in Flowers High School. I went there today. We only have six security officers there. I'm going back tomorrow morning to volunteer to stand on the door. Um, I'm worried about the safety of my child. So is all the other parents over there as well. I'm asking this board to give me 20 more officers to put in that school. We have 3,000 students in that building with six security officers. I think that's just the setup to make somebody get hurt. I want my child to go to school and to come home. I don't want my child to come home. Anybody. With those fights that we had there, thank you for bringing Dr. Brown back. We need him, but we need to support him as well. We need security back in that building. I will be there every day if I have to sit on all those doors to make sure those babies in that building is safe. And if I don't get security, I'm going to the press because this is unacceptable. I cannot understand why we have 3,000 students in the school with six security officers. We can't do that. You guys got to do better. We have to assist them. We just lost another baby. 
I don't want to lose mine. So I'm asking this board to give me some help for Dr. Brown over there. Put security in that building. And please send me a vice principal at William Hall Academy because this acting principal have the teachers giving other teachers direction and it's going to cause a problem and we do not want that we want to work together i like what you said accountability please please thank, thank you. you thank you so much um, <clears throat> our final speaker speaker is shannon reed individual suggestion for budget Good evening. At the beginning of this school year and last school year, 90% of all my students read far, far below grade level. Recently, I analyzed my English 10 students 2023 MCAP scores and realized that teacher-led reading and writing instruction embedded in grade level work produced significantly better results than the reading intervention program achieved 3,000. The MCAP pass rate for my two English 10 lab classes was 40 and 47%. In contrast, 68%, 86%, 40% and 21% of the students in my English 10 class has passed the English 10 MCAP. My school's English 10 MCAP average was 51.5%. The significantly different scores reflect many things, including students' poor work habits and conduct and the ineffectiveness of interventions. Too many students behave beyond disgracefully because their thinking and character have not been developed, wasting time on slander and a petition to get my A out of the building. Many students were supported by their parents. People led by their feelings missed the opportunity to learn and grow from examining objective reality. Students, teachers, parents, and administrators need rich, reliable data to, and feedback to understand their strengths and needs. 47% of students in the class with the 21% average were within 10 points of earning a passing score. Their results suggest that extended time and other changes would be helpful. Right now, many teachers inside the classroom are overwhelmed by the demands of dealing with too many underdeveloped and undisciplined students. These students are fully capable of learning but need strong support and not the decontextualized language of technology-based interventions. You can see this in the limited use of software interventions, including no red ink and ingenuity. I wonder what percentage of ingenuity students pass or have passed their MCAP exams. Building teacher capacity is essential for student development. After more than 10 years of close reading, students parrot, annotate the text when asked how to build reading com um, comprehension, but still have massively underdeveloped vocabularies, ineffective strategy use, issues with fluency, and distorted ideas of reading. Please consider allocating money and human resources to examine what is and is not working well. Achieve 3000 is in, not an effective intervention. The inclusion of 15 differentiated passages is simply a distortion of one aspect of effective reading instruction. Usage reports show that students typically spend three to 10 minutes on the program, explaining in part the 40 and 47% pass rate of my English 10 lab students. Have you considered how clinics um, with well-trained teachers and specialists could support students' reading and writing needs, offer extended learning uh, time play a role in creating effective RTI models. This would support students and teachers like me who are beyond exhausted. If I can get 86% in extraordinarily difficult circumstances, it can be done, but Thank not you. with the curriculum and structures in place now. Thank you for your time and attention. Thank you, Ms. Reed. <laughs> Thanks to everyone for your comments tonight. At this time, we have a, a discussion and presentation from our Maryland Association Board of Education Health about the MAB Association Board of Education Health Center program. And we want to, I want to recognize Mr. Milton Nagel, Executive Director of the Maryland Association of Boards of Education to report on this program. And welcome, welcome to Prince George's County. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Madam Chair, uh, Madam Vice Chair, members of the board. Uh, President House, uh, it's my p privilege uh, to be here tonight. It's uh, it, um, I'm new in the role. I was hired as the executive director this past summer. I spent two years prior to that at MABE in the deputy executive director role. Uh, never dreamed that I would uh, be, um, well, that I'd want this job, but um, 
I, I always look for the challenge and the opportunity to, um, to do better for all of our students because we are one Maryland. And as diverse as we are and as different as we are from a far western shore to western Maryland to the shores of the ocean, um, we're still all about it for the, for the same reason. I and mean, there's mm -hmm. as much as we can uh, disagree on, there's so much more that we can agree on. And that's a, the fundamental is we all are here for the, the very best thing for our students. And that, that's why we're here. So I, I echo um, Superintendent House's uh, congratulations on this being um, Board Recognition Month uh, and appreciation for all your selfish dedication. You certainly don't do this for the money, ladies and gentlemen. You do this for the passion, for, for wanting to make this school district a better, better for tomorrow's future. Um, there is a proclamation from the governor. Uh, it arrived, I guess, uh, today. And, we uh, have it, yes. Yeah, and mm -hmm. as well as a certificate of appreciation signed by uh, Maryland State Board of Education President Clarence Crawford and myself as the executive director. Uh, just a small token. Hopefully you'll find a, a suitable place to hang it up um, and be proud of, of what you do. Yeah, we're going to make the presentation later, but we thank you. Oh, okay. I'll, I'm okay. going to stick around as long okay. as... So I'm going to try to hang out till the end anyway. So um, one of the things that I've spent a long time doing is looking at, um, you know, I'm a, my background, I'm actually a CPA. Uh, so I spent a lot of time looking at how to stretch the dollar and, and what's important. Um, and, and I will tell you that um, teachers go into this profession because of their passion for the craft. But a good half of your, of, of your enrollment as far as your workforce are not teachers. And they come to work for the school district primarily, some of them for the passion, some of them because they want to give back to the community. But it's, it's benefits. It's the pension system, the ability to, to collect that pension someday down the road, but it, it's also health insurance. Health insurance is key. It's a big ticket item. It's, a, it's an employee uh, attraction, ret uh, recruitment tool, as well as an employee retention tool. But in my course of my career, which is well over 30 years now, I have seen the most rapidly rising line item in everybody's budget around the state is health insurance. The cost of health insurance continues to outpace nearly every other line item as a percentage increase year over year. And it's not sustainable. We have very rich benefits, but at some point there's a breaking point. And if you look at, you know, as you get into your budget deliberations, uh, you know, on any given year, health insurance is always one that comes to the, to the table. And at the same time, access to quality health care is diminishing. And so I guess I've, um, I've got the clicker, so I'm going to drive this, this presentation here. Um, and basically, you know, remind you that, that we are MABE, we're here for you, and um, we are a champion for excellence in public education. And through a new, newly developed uh, arm of MABE called MABE Health Solutions, we want to be a champion for benefits excellence to make careers in education a lifelong destination. As I mentioned before, it's a recruitment tool, but it's also a retention tool. You don't want to lose your workforce to another employer, um, and benefits is one of the things that keeps them there. Um, so through MABE Health, you can access uh, health benefits solutions that we're bringing to the table. I'm going to talk specifically about one. That's the health center program, uh, which provides access to primary and what's commonly referred to as mental health services. I like to refer to it as brain health services because that's what it is. It's about dealing with the, the largest organ in your body, your brain. Um, I think it gets a bad uh, stereotype. Of, of being called mental health services. I think we need to change that conversation and start talking about what it is, and it's the brain. And there's also a lot of regulatory issues coming down the pike in the next coming years, few, few years that school districts around the state are going to have to pay attention to. So what have we done in this, in this arena, in this uh, workspace? So in 2022, MSDE had the Leeds Grants Program, and under that faculty and staff retention pillar, for health, uh, they allowed health centers to be uh, a permissible use of those monies f as it relates to recruitment and retention of staff. So, and we had a, um, some districts take advantage of their LEADS grants uh, in that capacity. This past uh, fiscal year, the state of Maryland 
is starting to wake up and see the, the need for, for what we're doing. And they allocated $875,000 to MAVE in a grant to assist with health center startup costs. And um, we, this fiscal year, are committing those monies to a variety of school districts, and they're shown there at the bottom. St. Mary's County, Wicomico, Washington, and we've got some earmarks for a couple others that are in the due diligence phase. In addition, MAKO, which can be our adversary and also our partner, depending on what the topic is. But MAKO has seen the, the fact that, look, this is, this is something we really need to focus on. And so they've adopted the same scenario as it relates to, to health center models. And most recently, the, the Maryland Comptroller toured the one health center that's open in Queen Anne's County to, um, to see what it's all about as it relates to possibly expanding it to the Maryland State uh, workforce. So one of the things that, a um, little bit more about myself, I know a little about a lot of things, but I don't know a whole lot about much, okay? I'm not a subject matter expert in a lot of things, but I'm smart enough to find the subject matter experts to talk about these things. And so that's who, um, Mabe has partnered with Bolton, and Bolton is benefit uh, consulting firm that actually provides services here to Prince George's County Public Schools. Um, so they're no stranger to your staff. Uh, but Bolton is the entity that we've partnered with for MABE Health Solutions. And it's because of a history that MABE already had with Bolton. I already had that history with Bolton in my previous life working for a school district. Um, so it was a natural fit to continue that relationship with Bolton. And so I'm going to introduce and allow um, my partner in the MABE Health Solutions, who's um, you know, key person, uh, employee at Ed Bolton, Mr. Stuart Sutley, to continue uh, this presentation. Thank you, Milton. Good evening, everybody. Um, just a couple slides here, and I will move through this pretty quickly, but just to set the stage, you know, we're, we're at real crisis around the country with access to primary care and brain health support. I think many of us have probably already seen this, but Maryland actually is has more of a challenge going on is we have one of the highest retirement age groups of primary care physicians in the country so more are retiring we also have one of the greatest um, areas of physicians moving to concierge care does anybody have concierge care doctor um, most of us don't because it means you pay them twenty five hundred dollars a year not in your health insurance to have access so that starts to create the haves versus the have-nots. So Maryland is really in a very big deficit with access. I'm not going to read all this, but just to tell you that one of the key things besides lack of access due to cost, but people also are avoiding health care because they can't get in or the wait time is too long. So if they're avoiding health care, that becomes a problem with health, um, future issues with time off, et cetera. There's a study that just came out by the National Alliance. It just came out in December. It had some um, really fascinating information. But the biggest one was that what's top of mind for all employers is recruiting and retention. But rising health care costs are, are becoming a significant challenge to balance that out. How do I recruit people, pay them what they want, but also continue to give them rich benefits? So with that being said, We've been looking, from Bolton's perspective, working with MABE on solutions. I came to Bolton about two years ago. I used to run the health center practice for Johns Hopkins Medicine. And one of the things that I've had a background in is putting health centers into employer settings around the country. I've probably done close to 50 of them myself. In 2022, Prince George's County government actually commissioned us. It was my first project when I came to Bolton. Um, to do a feasibility study on health centers. And just so you know a little bit about the county that you probably already know, but Prince George's County is deemed as medically underserved. You have 1.33 uh, pediatricians per 1,000 residents in this county, where the state of Maryland has 4.5 in total. So you have a real deficit in care there. You also have about 54 primary care physicians per 1,000 residents in this county, um, where the average in Maryland is 188 per 100,000 residents. So there is a real lack of access within this county. And that is 
cha challenging many people to go outside the county for care. And as Mr. Nagel said, Bolton, we manage your health benefits. We see that in your claims calls where people are going into DC or going into Montgomery County to get access for care because they can't find it here. So what have we done? We have found a partner. We did a very extensive RFP process and we identified a partner that has over 400 health centers across the country that are dedicated to just employers. And it is just for their, the employees and dependents, three, year olds, three years old and up. And this group that we have contracted with called Everside Health has a very large client list across the country in the public sector space. And as Milton showed you earlier, we have about six health centers now with counties and schools in Maryland that are either opened or starting to open based on this model that we're bringing through MABE Health and now with the support of MAKO. With the vision that we one day have this network of health centers just dedicated to your faculty, staff, and dependents that are across the state. If somebody's heading down to the beach, and they need to stop at the one that's opening in Wicomico County Public Schools in April, you can stop there and get care. This sits next to your health plan. There is no cost to the employee or their family member to use this. This is not insurance. This is paid for out of the health plan. So real quick, how does that work? You're self-insured. So you are the bank, right? You're paying for your health care. Healthcare is one of the craziest places I've ever seen where, you know what, we pay the bill after people go and get all these services done, right? You don't really know what your healthcare costs are going to be until the bill comes in. Under this model, we're bringing your cost as a school district is fixed. You would pay for the health center services the same amount month after month, whether somebody used it once a month or somebody used it 30 times a month. The cost does not change. So if you're starting to take all that expense with emergency care visits, urgent care visits, um, people getting sick, and you start to drive that variable spend into a fixed cost health center, you will start to see a return on your investment. And we're already seeing that and demonstrating that. I've seen that across the country for years. So they do all these different services, plus other things that fall outside of your health plan, like DOT exams for bus drivers. Uh, pre-employment exams, drug screenings, anything you can think of, most of it can be done within these health centers. So one of the things that we've really seen, and we have some superintendents, um, as a couple who would speak to this, uh, one already in Maryland, is we've got Queen Anne's County and Queen Anne's County Public Schools partnered together on a health center in Centerville, Maryland. They are using this health center as a big recruiting tool. They know, because they ask, why did you decide to come here? And nine out of 10 people are saying, one of the reasons, because you're giving me free access to healthcare. Again, this is a benefit that they get to use, which ultimately will start to save you money on your healthcare spend, because there's a return on investment on it. So we put this whole thing together. We've done this with MABE. We built a strategy for each school district and county. It has a return on investment that's calculated. And we also put guarantees around it with the vendor we um, provide. So they will put performance guarantees in place to make sure that we're able to meet this. They also drive the engagement. This is not build it and it's up to you all to figure out how to get people there. The, the success of these health centers is tied into the vendor getting people in the door. So they manage all the recruiting, all the uh, acquisition of getting patients in there and the outcomes of that. So how's it work? Last slide here. So MABE and MAKO, but we'll, we'll talk about MABE has their master service agreement in place with the vendor that we vetted. And what we're seeing right now is interested schools are purchasing through that master service agreement. The fees are on a PMPM -PM basis, depending on your size. With your size, you'll be on the, the lower end of the cost structure. So I like to say if it's $30 per person per month, for less than $400 a year, people are not only getting unlimited access to primary care and mental health resources where somebody is spending 30 to 45 minutes with their patient, not 10, because this is not fee for service. I don't have to get a lot of people through. Plus these health centers are doing prescriptions and lab work. So it's a one-stop shop. I can get everything under one umbrella. 
Again, it does not in replace your insurance plan, and we're putting performance guarantees around this to make sure that this cost becomes something that turns into a positive for any of the entities that put this in place. Where do these go? They go into a commercial space that might already be available out there. This is in Centerville, Maryland, existing Class B office space that was converted into the Queen Anne's County Public Schools Health Center, open again just to their employees and dependents. So quick snapshot there of something that we're seeing already rolled out, rolling across the state. The state of Maryland is not the first state to do this. There are lots of other states that have got school districts and counties across the country doing this model. It's been around for years, but it is really new in Maryland, and we hope to see if there's interest within the Prince George's County Public School entity to see if this is something to consider in the future. Thank you very much for your time. Are there any Thank questions? Thank you. Uh, Superintendent House? Any questions? We'll take a close look. It's actually something we had in our in my, my previous uh, previous school district that worked extremely well. Uh, so we look forward to, to having some additional conversation. Great. Thank you, sir. Okay. And I see a light from Board Member Route. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, in a neighboring jurisdiction where I worked, we did have access to something similar. Um, so I understand the benefits. I'm worried about the scale. The scale as, uh, you know, we have a lot of employers and if we would be opening up to their members, to our employers and their families, um, could you help me understand the, uh, the capacity that you have uh, for a district of this size, um, in addition to understanding the pediatric aspect. Thank you so much. Sure. So um, very simply, this is uh, not open to the public. So this is contracted with an employer. So say you're the employer. There wouldn't be other employers in the community that would be able to access this unless you gave them permission to. So number one is we kind of call them the anchor. So whoever is the anchor, it's your health center. So again, operated by a third party, but you get to call the rules of who uses it, the hours that it operates, et cetera. We've already mapped out, um, because we did this work for the county uh, uh, two years ago, that it would take about six to eight health centers in, in kind of spread out across the county to meet the needs of the county employees and the school employees and their family members and staffed appropriately. Each of the physicians that work in these handle about a thousand patients each as primary care, where in the real world, the physician clinician world of health systems, they have about 2,500 patients. So right. it's a smaller patient panel to spend a lot more time. If the employer, as yourself, were to say, we want to have pediatrics, then in the recruiting process, they go and find clinical people trained in pediatrics to also work in those health centers. They're doing three-year-olds and up. Most parents want to, in the first couple of years, stay with somebody. But, you know, when you're talking about a lot of just the day-to-day -day things that you have with pediatrics, I got strep, I got this, and I can pop in without an appointment and get a medication for my kid, it's great. Um, we have a, the largest school system uh, one of the largest school systems in Pennsylvania, um, Bolton, we opened a health center there a year ago, and their uh, sick days are, redu have, are down by 20% year over year. And the biggest benefit the teachers have said is I can bring my kid in, get them what they need, and get them back to school without taking a half a day off. So I hope that answers your question. Um, but again, we would have to scale it appropriate based on the commitment. Thank you so much, yes, Chair. I don't have any other questions. Thank you. And, and you understand your conversation will be with the Superintendent of the House and his team. Uh, absolutely. I just want to be clear. <laughs> we, I truly understand it's an operational, <laughs> okay. it's, it's an operational issue. But, um, you know, Madam Chair, again, I appreciate that opportunity. I failed to mention, you know, one of my goals, I want to come back. Yeah, so I welcome the opportunity if there's any other topic, anything that MABE offers as far as products and services. Um, you know, this is certainly on the cutting edge. This is new for us, but I envision I'm a Pollyanna optimist to think that someday we will have health centers all over this great state and we'll be a model for other states to look at um, as far as taking care of our employees and their dependents because it's important because the more you can retain 
that high quality staff, whether it be a teacher in the classroom, which is arguably the most important variable, but it also you got to have the bus driver because without them, they don't get to school or get home from school. Mm -hmm. And you got to have the food service worker and everybody in between. They're all important. It takes a village to raise them. And so ret retaining them, and this is a, a tool that will keep them employed with Prince George's County for a career, and you'll see your, your longevity increase significantly. I do have, um, I do have some, some uh, handouts for you as far as products and services from Abe. I'll leave them with... We'll leave them with uh, Miss Cindy Adline. Yep, there. and uh, she can distribute them. And again, thank you for the opportunity to come before you this evening. It's great to see everybody and look forward to seeing you again. And hopefully, uh, obviously, as, as mentioned earlier, at the Legislative Day coming up on February 5th in Annapolis, please come to the, to the Calvert House for that, 5 to 7. Okay. And then... Um, and. Um, Actually, before that, I don't know if anybody's coming to NS NSBA's uh, equity. Um, oh, a lot of us are yeah, coming. So yes. we'll see you we in a, in a, we will in a, see you. Yeah, we'll see you yes. in a couple of weeks down the yes, street. Yes, will. Yeah, so thank you. Thank, thank you, thank you so much, and it's good to see Mabe out and about, too, within the district. So this is good. Appreciate it. Thank, thank you, guys. You. All right, next on our agenda is a blueprint update from board member Pamela Booza Struther. <laughs> thank you, Chair Mickens Murray. Um, I'm actually um, I'm giving this update as a former member of MABE's ad hoc committee on the blueprint implementation. That committee uh, existed last year, um, but MABE has now folded that into the legislative committee where um, colleague board member uh, Briggs now serves. Uh, so what I wanted to say this evening about the blueprint is just to highlight that this is the number one legislative agenda for all of our partners um, from uh, MSCA and MSDE, MABE, all the, the boards across Maryland, um, that the Blueprint for Maryland's Future and the promise of the Kerwin Commission, the full funding plan uh, is the top priority. And so as PGCPS, a system that in many ways, we could look back to 2018 and the work of the Kerwin Commission and the beginnings of the blueprint uh, legislation, what we called the down payment that funded our first 45 community schools, grew from there to the actual passage of the blueprint that you could say that this is, was written for PGCPS. And I want to say that all of us as colleagues on this board, as um, our, our leadership, um, our school level who are implementing the blueprint, Dr. Libby's team that coordinated the plan, that I'm asking all of PGCPS to really uh, take a step back and really understand the plan if you haven't taken that time, because we are going into an Annapolis session where you, have, where you uh, students, parents, community members will get to talk to your legislators this session. And it's an imperative that we show up. Um, Blueprint Lobby Day, uh, hosted by Strong Schools Maryland, is on Monday, February 12th at 7 p.m. And that is a date that we will be putting out uh, and asking, just like in 2019 when PGCPS um, uh, worked with PGCEA and went to the a rally to fund our schools, we had the PGCPS buses and bus drivers take us there. And while we may not be do we may or may not be doing it exactly that way this year, this year is the pivotal year to to think that this may be what we need to be ready for. Um, we have been we we know the economic outlook. We we've, we've been told by Governor Moore, we've been told by Comptroller Learman that. Um, that we have a deficit and uh, preserving the bl blueprint is on us. So what I would like to say to everyone watching our meetings, um, to all of our leadership, to all of our um, in, in our school buildings, our principals and our community schools coordinators who are the blueprint pillar four, um, that we do have a website, the Blueprint for Maryland's Future 2023-24, website has every resource that anyone can need to fully understand the blueprint. So if when you hear blueprint for Maryland's future, which <clears throat> the state survey says 
Many people in this state don't know what the blueprint is. We at PGCPS, Prince George's County, we are going to say 100% of Prince Georgians understand the blueprint because we are fully invested in our children. So if you are feeling like, wow, I'm not sure I know the five pillars, I'm not sure I know PGCPS's implementation plan, it is all on this website. And I'm just asking everyone to take a step back and think, how can I contribute to preserving the blueprint? And so that is my <laughs> update this evening. Thank you, thank you, Chair Vickens Murray. Thank you so very much. I, I hope that the folks in this uh, room and our community can see that this board is committed to bringing home resources for our children. And we need help. We're asking for that help. And that's a good segue to our next four topics, 4.1 to 4.5. We are forming amongst the board members ad hoc committees to move the work forward. I have appointed for the audit ad hoc committee, board member Brandon Jackson will lead that ad hoc committee. Board member Zipporah Miller and Juanita Miller are members. We also have, I'm going to leave the climate change to last because you want to make some remarks. The next committee, Accessible Advisory Ad Hoc Committee, we're, establishing, we're not establishing that committee. There's a policy 1700 that we're revisiting and we want to make sure that we're in compliance. And that effort will be led by uh, board member Jocelyn Rout and board member Shayla Adams Stafford. And now we'll go back to 4.4 which is the Prince George's County Climate Change Action Plan Ad Hoc Committee. And this committee has already come up with a plan. They want to talk to us a little bit tonight. So the chair will recognize, I think I'm recognizing Dr. Harris. <laughs> okay, because it's co-led by Dr. Harris and board member Pamela Boozer Struther. Dr. Harris. Very good, thank you for recognizing me, chair. And I'm so excited to be speaking on our ad hoc committee for the climate aid climate change action plan. Um, before I get started, I'd be remiss to not thank my vice chair, um, Ms. Pamela Boozer Struthers for the work that she did with the climate change action plan focus work group that really got us here to this point today. Also a few other partners that have joined us throughout this time, uh, Joseph Jakuda, Kate Wunderlich, and Christina Kwok were very instrumental in us getting uh, forward on this day. And sorry if I missed a few folks. Um, I'll be short today. The full mem memorandum is on board docs. Uh, and then we have a special guest that's going to speak to us for a few minutes here at the end. Um, so the Prince George's County and its public schools developed a, uh, a national model to combat climate change for students and communities' future. This over 100-page document, the PGCPS Climate Change Action Plan, was developed by 22 diverse climate experts, and it serves as our roadmap to change. And our call to action to empower our students, our staff, partners and administration to work together to transform our future on an economic, social, and environmental level. The PGCPS CCAP, as I refer to it, our recommendations are adopted by the Board of were adopted by the Board of Education during our April 28, 2022 meeting. The superintendent was charged with the implementation of eight priority recommendations and supporting actions, sub-recommendations, implementation timelines, environmental justice, and lab or considerations, financing opportunities, responsible parties, and resources needed. The eight priority areas are, number one, support environmental justice through climate curriculum training and partnerships. So that's training up our, our students, our staff, our employees on how to properly use this plan and to incorporate it into their daily lives. Number two is reducing our carbon footprint from PGCPS buildings as well as number three is commit to renewable energy sources for a net zero emissions future, meaning that we produce more energy than we put out. Number four, commit to low carbon school transportation, so that's improving our bus fleets, that's improving our ways of, of getting to school, that's our uh, safe passages, that's walking, that's biking. Um, number four is reducing food waste and grow climate friendly food, healthier food options for our students, um, community gardens, things of that nature. Number six, commit to sustainable materials management and procurement. Number seven, commit to climate resilient land management. And number eight, lead by example to support transformational change. Since the adoption of CCAP, PGCPS staff has been 
uh, has begun its implementation of eight of these eight priority areas um, in their intermental work group was formed in July of 2022. The steps accomplished through this work group have been publicly um, discussed in our mid-year report in January of 2023 and an end-year report in July 2023. Additionally, in the fall of 2023, the Director of Sustainability and Resilience was hired to lead these efforts, and I'll turn the floor over to our COO, Dr. Coleman, for an introduction. Thank you so much, Dr. Harris, and members of the board for, your, for this presentation. In fulfilling the recommendations of the Prince George's County Public Schools Climate Change Action Plan, the administration hired a sustainability and resiliency director this past fall to help shepherd the implementation of the Climate Change Action Plan and drive our collective sustainability efforts throughout the school system. We are working to bolster the capacity of this new department with additional hires and reorganizing existing in-house talent in the coming months. The administration in collaboration with the board and multiple stakeholders has been working diligently to make progress in the priority action items of the CCAP. We look forward to sharing these latest accomplishments in the 2024 mid-year report, which is currently under development. With that, I invite Ms. Dorothy Morrison, our Director of Sustainability and Resiliency, to come up and give greetings. Ms. Morrison joins us with over two decades of experience in public service, spanning government, nonprofit, and private sectors, and most recently served as Director for the Office of Environment at the Maryland Department of Transportation Headquarters. Ms. Morrison. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for the introduction, Dr. Coleman and um, Dr. Harris as well. So, you know, it's an opportunity to sort of say hi to everyone. So thank you for that. It's always great to be able to put a face to the name as well as the role. Um, I'm truly excited and honored to have this opportunity to serve um, our children, the school system, as well as the county I've lived in for about 30 years now. So with that said, um, I just want to say, like Dr. Uh, Coleman mentioned, um, I have been in this space for over two decades now. Um, while I have been in the role for over two decades, I have not been in a role in the school system. So this is an opportunity for me to serve in the school system. I think it's important because it's an opportunity to help to not only drive um, sustainability management and climate action for the administration and operation services, but also an opportunity to educate our, our students, our, our children who are the future leaders of tomorrow. So I look forward to that opportunity to engage in things like curriculum development and education and awareness around climate change and sustainability. I also would like to thank the board the great leadership of Prince George's County administration because they've been very, very supportive of the climate efforts in developing, first of all, in developing the plan and implementing it. Um, folks like, um, don't want to call you out, but <laughs> I surely we will. Um, uh, board member um, Pamela uh, Booza Struthers, uh, she's been very, very supportive in this effort. So I really want to say thank you. It's really exciting to, to come into this role and see that there's so much already being done. And it's just uh, for me to sort of take on the mantle and do my very best in terms of moving things forward. So I definitely look forward to the opportunity. And this sustainability involves, it's huge, right? So it involves the village and involves a lot of collaboration. So I look forward to the opportunity to collaborate with each and every one of you here in this room as well as um, others elsewhere. So with that, I'd like to say thank you again and have a good evening. Thank you. And we're so excited to have Ms. Morrison. Just one last thing. We're so excited to have her here. She continues to build and develop her team out. One thing I'd like to mention is that also our ad hoc committee moves in line with the strategic plan for PGCPS, um, as well as as we build out the members of the committee, it would also, in similar fashion to the work group, will include students on board. So we, it's very important us to have the student voice in the, in the equation as well. So thank you. Uh, back to you, Chair. Thank you so much. So my, my hope is that these ad hoc committee chairs will come back to our next board meeting in February prepare to report out at least on who is your membership, who you are recommending to this board to be a part of your membership. And community folks out there listening to us, call these folks, volunteer. 
<laughs> okay, thank you. Next, we will have the, uh, the chair recognizes Superintendent House to report on the consent agenda. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, at, this, at this juncture, we ask the board to consider items uh, 5.1 uh, through 5.4, and I believe we have some proclamations uh, that are on the table, so we'll start with 5.1. Okay, do you want to do all of um, the 5.1 through to 5.4? Sure, I and think. And then we'll read the one from the governor and the. Perfect. Okay. Sounds good. All right, so we. We're going to make a motion to pass the proclama Perfect. proclamations that you had. So, board members, I need a motion. Chair Mickens Murray, I move to uh, accept proclamation uh, items 5.1, proclamation for observation of African American Read In Month. 5.2, proclamation for observation of National African American History Month. 5.3, Proclamation for Observation of Career and Technical Education Month, and 5.4, Proclamation for Maryland School Board Recognition Month. Second. Is there a, there's a motion on the floor to approve all proclamations 5.51 through 5.4. Is there a second? Mr. Briggs. It has been moved and seconded. And we will have a discussion. Uh, board Member LaSalle Frazier. <laughs> Sorry, that was oh, me. Oh, okay. Board member Dr. Yeah, Harris. I had a question about section four. So if we want to take the vote, then I can ask my question after that, if that's fine. I don't have a discussion about this. Oh, you were going backwards? Yeah. <laughs> okay. So the motion on the floor is to approve the proclamations from 5.1 through 5.4. Any discussion? Seeing none, Ms. Adeline, please call the roll. Mrs. Adam Stafford? Ms. Buda Struthers? Aye. Mr. Briggs? Aye. Dr. Harris? Aye. Mr. Jackson? Aye. Mrs. Asaya Frazier? Aye. Dr. J. Miller? Dr. Z. Miller? Aye. Mrs. Rao? Aye. Ms. Walker? Aye. Ms. Rivera Forbes? Aye. Ms. Mickens Murray? Aye. 11 in affirmatives, uh, zero in the negative the motion carries now at this time we have received a proclamation from the governor west moore which i will read into the record and we've also received a certificate from the maryland association of school boards which vice chair walker will read into the record the state of maryland proclamation from the governor of the state of maryland Whereas the Maryland Association of Boards of Education is a private, nonprofit profit organization dedicated to serving and supporting boards of education in Maryland, and whereas students greatly benefit from the state school boards providing access to essential academic, social, emotional, and economic supports, and our state is grateful to all of Maryland school boards that work to ensure a rigorous and world-class educational experience for every <laughs> Maryland student. Now, therefore, I, Westmore, Governor of the State of Maryland, do hereby proclaim January 2024 as Maryland's School Board Recognition Month in Maryland and call upon the people of our state to join in this observance. Thank you so much, Governor Moore. Vice Chair Walker. Absolutely. Maryland School Board Recognition Month, Certificate of Recognition. This certificate is proudly presented to Prince George's County Board of Education for dedicated leadership in Prince George's County and committed service to the schools and students of Prince George's County Public Schools. Your hard work, dedication, and achievement are applauded. Signed by President Clarence C. Crawford, Maryland State Board of Education, and Executive Director Milton Nagel, who is here. Uh, thank you. Maryland Association of Boards of Education. Thank you. Thank you. And now we will, see, we will receive one more recognition from our superintendent. 
Yes, ma'am, we do have uh, one additional uh, proclamation that I'd like to, uh, to read. It's the Maryland School Board Recognition Month, uh, whereas January 2022 uh, was first established as uh, School Board Recognition Month uh, in the state of Maryland, and whereas education is the cornerstone of thriving and vibrant communities, shaping the future of our children and contributing to the overall well-being of society. And whereas the Prince George's County Board of Education plays a crucial role in advancing the mission of providing quality education to our students, fostering a supportive learning environment and preparing our youth for the, uh, the challenges and opportunities of the future. And whereas the dedication, leadership, and tireless efforts of the Board of Education members deserve recognition and appreciation for their commitment and uh, to the betterment of our education system. And whereas January continues to provide an opportunity for our community to express gratitude and acknowledge the exemplary service of our Board of Education members. Therefore, be it resolved, Prince George's County Public Schools and the Board of Education recognize the month of January 2024 as Maryland School Board Recognition Month, and be it finally resolved, that we call upon school administrators, teachers, students, and parents to honor this observance by participating in the appropriate activities and programs for Maryland School Board Recognition Month in Prince George's County Public Schools. Signed, Judy mickens -Murray, Board Chair at Millard House. Thank you so much. And for the public, we received candy from our superintendent today, so we're very excited. Board members to the center, please. We will take a picture with our proclamation. All right, all right. Not the candy. Y'all ate some people going in. <laughs> no judgment. So to the staff and all the community folks, you can send us anything you want us to have for this month. Amen. We will pick it up from the, from the uh, office of the Board of Education. Thanks to everyone. As long as it's $25. <laughs> Not over $25, right? Okay. Uh, next, we will go to the... I'm excited because we were acknowledged. Oh, we're going to the... I recognize the superintendent house for approval of education for 6.1. Thank you, Madam Chair. Of course, the administration moves forward to, uh, for approval for um, uh, of the educational uh, specifications for phases one and two of the Cool Springs Adelphi Elementary School replacement project. The question is on the adoption of the budget consent agenda item 6.1. I move that we oh, accept. No, no, okay. okay. <laughs> I move to adopt item 6.1, approval of the educational specifications for phases one and two of the Cool Spring Adelphi Elementary School replacement project. Second. Okay, it has been moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, Ms. Adeline, please call the roll. Mrs. Adam Safford? Yes. Mrs. Blue Yes. 
<laughs> Mr. Briggs? Aye. Dr. Harris? Aye. Mr. Jackson? Aye. Mrs. Desai Frazier? Aye. Dr. J. Miller? Dr. Z. Miller? Aye. Mr. Murray? Mrs. Rao? Aye. Ms. Walker? Aye. Ms. Rivera Forbes? Aye. Ms. Mickensbury? Uh, aye. We have 10 in the affirmative, zero in the negative. The motion carries. Now we will move to 8.1. We are now the new business first reader for items 8.1 through 8.3. The chair recognizes Dr. Zipporah Miller. Madam Chair, thank you so much. I would like to uh, make a motion. So I would like to move to accept item 8.2, the um, rescission of Pointer Ridge Elementary School consolidation and dependent comprehensive education and boundary changes to be declared as an emergency item and discussed separately. Second. Okay, it has been moved and seconded to move item 8.2 as an emergency uh, reader for the, to accept the rescission of Pointer Ridge Elementary School consolidation and dependent comprehensive education boundary changes be declared an emergency motion. It has been moved and seconded. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, seeing no lights. Ms. Adeline, please call the roll. Ms. Adam Safford? Ms. Bullis Ruther? Aye. Mr. Briggs? Aye. Dr. Harris? Aye. Mr. Jackson? Aye. Mrs. Osaye Frazier? Aye. Dr. J. Miller? Dr. Z. Miller? Aye. Mrs. Rao? Aye. Ms. Walker? Aye. Ms. Rivera Forbes? Aye. Ms. Vickensbury? Aye. Ten in the affirmative, zero in the, ne in the um, negative. The motion carries to treat item 8.2 as an emergency item. Now I will read. Uh, recognize Superintendent House. Thank you, Madam Chair. We're going to uh, move back to the uh, al uh, the item uh, in reference to school year 2024-25 PGCPS calendar. And I'd like to first of all just thank uh, both uh, Dr. Andy Zuckerman as well as Dr. Christy Baldwin for really heading up the calendar committee. Uh, at this time, I'd like to uh, pass the microphone over to Dr. Uh, Zuckerman for some brief comments. Thank you, Mr. House. Um, so for first reader, you have the uh, draft calendar before you, and uh, we look forward to discussing it um, at the next board meeting at, at second reader, and, and certainly can answer any questions you have. We had a lot of community feedback, a lot of stakeholder involvement uh, this year, and we think we have a calendar that addresses uh, the issues, and, and we heard the, the concerns raised last time about half days at the end of the year. We think we've resolved that, too. So uh, to the maximum extent possible. So uh, this calendar meets, um, we think, just the various needs for uh, that, that we face here just with the, the various constraints in the state of Maryland and uh, just our different negotiated agreements to get to the, the best calendar for our, our students. Thank you. OK, I recognize board member Rout. Thank you so much. Um, as the parent seat on the board, I have heard from all of our parents with regard to um, the choices of our school calendar. And the feedback uh, from uh, members, parents, uh, guardians all over is regarding our winter break. And both of them, um, both of the options that were presented in the survey were um, similar, right? With regard to the winter break and given um, the winter break uh, parents, guardians, and some students have been very vocal that neighboring jurisdictions uh, in Maryland and outside of Maryland get a longer break. Um, and so that is the feedback that I would like uh, to champion as it relates to our school calendar. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. The, the winter break in the calendar presented to the board is two full weeks. And the options uh, that the community uh, feedback was based around was a more traditional one week plus whatever would fall right after New Year's or two weeks. And so overwhelmingly, the feedback was for 
um, a two-week winter break, like you said. And interestingly, when you benchmark with the other school systems, um, most Maryland school systems actually are not doing a two-week winter break, whereas Virginia is. And I think that's partly just a reflection of how um, calendars are created in both uh, uh, states. But I think we can, we can pull off the two-week winter break. Thank you. Board Member Rivera Thwarts. Yes, so I actually had the amazing opportunity to work on this committee as well, and I wanted to thank um, you both for giving me that opportunity. I loved it. I definitely loved being a part of the process and the two other students that were involved as well. I think it definitely made a big difference, and also with us promoting the survey so our biggest stakeholders could have a say in this. I think that was amazing, so I'm looking forward to the board seeing um, all the hard work that's been put into this calendar, I think it's amazing, especially the two-week break. A little sad that it's coming my senior year, but <laughs> that's okay. I'm happy the next generation of students will get it. So thank you again, and I'm looking forward for all of us to see this. So board members, the motion on the floor is to approve 8.1 uh, school year 2024-2025 PGCBS school calendar and 8.2 rescission of Pointer Ridge Elementary School Consolidation and um, Dependent Comprehensive Education Boundary Changes. Oh, I did that wrong. Okay, it's 2024 and I'm excited because we were recognized as, as being board members, so I will <laughs> take that back. Um, so what is on the floor is 8.1 as a first reader. Okay, because we are approving Pointer Ridge tonight I got it okay thank you <laughs> uh, would you call the roll please on the approval of 8.1 the school year 2024-2025 Prince George's County school calendar Miss Adeline Miss Adams Madam chair point of order yes we didn't do that right either I thought that it was the first reader for 8.1 am I wrong do we have a motion is there a motion on the floor? Yeah, the motion on the floor is for 8.1. I thought it was approved and seconded. Second. Second. Thank you. Oh, no one seconded. Is that what you're saying? Okay. We're going to do better next year, next month, uh, community. We really are. <laughs> this has been a night. All right. So the motion on the floor is to approve. I mean, to approve as a first reader. 1.1. I mean, 8.1, school year 2024-2025, Prince George's County school calendar. Second. And it has been moved and properly seconded. And I see a light from Z. Miller. Is that your light? I think it's an error. It's an error? Okay. You were trying to correct me. I appreciate it. Thank you. All right. Ms. Adeline, please call the roll. Chairman Kismari, who moved? I didn't move. I seconded. It was a... <laughs> I thought it was a guy. So move, I'll move. It's okay. Oh, I'll move it. over Eight here. It, I know I'll it was a male voice. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Harris. And then it's seconded by um, Vice Chair Walker. Mrs. Adam Stafford. Ms. Buddha Strother. Aye. Mr. Briggs. Aye. Dr. Harris. Aye. Mr. Jackson. Aye. Mrs. Asaya Frazier. Aye. Dr. J. Miller. Dr. Z. Miller. Mrs. Aye. Mrs. Brown? Aye. Ms. Walker? Aye. Ms. Rivera Forbes? Aye. Ms. McInsbury? 11 in the affirmative, zero in the uh, negative. The motion carries. The second motion on the floor, I mean, we need a motion on the floor to rescind for the rescission of Pointer Ridge Elementary School consolidation. Point of order, Madam oh, Chair. Yeah. I hate to do this, but there were not 11 in the affirmative. Ten. Okay. Um, it's I, I, I apologize. There was All right. It's ten in the affirmative. Ten in the affirmative. One absent. Someone abstained. Uh -huh. Oh, right. It's only ten because somebody's yeah. back. They want to. Okay, they're not out here. All right. So. Okay, there were 10 in the affirmative and none in the negative to pass the Prince George's County Public School calendar. Okay. Madam Chair. 
All right. Madam Chair. Yes, sir, parliamentarian. When they take the roll call vote, would you please ask everyone to speak up and not whisper when they're voting? That would help me a lot. Thank you, sir. At least someone is trying to help me in this room. I appreciate you. <laughs> okay. All right. 8.2, rescission of Pointer Ridge Elementary School Consolidation and Dependent Comprehensive Education Boundary Changes. We need a motion. I move, and I'm really excited to do this. Good. <laughs> I move uh, that we approve the, rec the rescission of the Pointer Ridge Elementary School Consolidation and Dependent Comprehensive Education and Boundary Changes. Second. Second. Okay, it has been moved and seconded by Dr. Z. Miller and seconded by board member Brandon and a few others, but you use Brandon. <laughs> uh, any discussion? And I see a light. Dr. Miller. I, I just want to take the time, um, Mr. House, to thank you and to really thank your executive team for really taking the time to listen to the community. But even more importantly, you took the time to explore options for all of our students in Prince George's County. And you made um, a decision to realign the space to accommodate uh, students with autism. So we just wanna say thank you for that because I feel that this is a win-win for all students in the county. And so, um, we will wel welcome our new students to Pointer Ridge in the 2024-2025 school year. I tried to figure out who on your team, and I said if I started calling out names, I might miss someone. <laughs> so I'm gonna take a chance, but I think Dr. Coleman, Dr. White, Dr. Davis, I'm sure there are many others, please let me know, uh, but um, help me. It's a collective effort and um, you know it's this is about strategy and taking a look at what our major needs are in the school district and it was an opportunity to uh, uh, to really meet the needs that was uh, for a program that um, uh, this particular area of, of the uh, the county is, is struggling with in terms of seats uh, so uh, so we're looking forward to uh, accommodating in this manner and as you indicated I think uh, the strategy behind my team as well thank you so much thank you board member Rowett Thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Miller, you said it amazingly, um, but I would be remiss as a advocate for children with autism without recognizing just the power um, in what happened um, in, in with uh, the rescission of Porter Ridge Elementary School. Um, and this is the innovation that I know that our school system will be able to continue to do. We saw, we heard from our community, and we figured out how to fit in a need. And that's amazing, right? Um, and I just would like to also thank our parents who advocated um, and who were partners in, uh, in, in championing the needs of uh, the Bowie community. Um, I was ecstatic when um, I received your email. Superintendent, thank you so much for really listening um, to the community and really for all of your chiefs um, for putting their heads together to be able to come up with this. This is phenomenal um, and I look forward to all of our students with autism um, and I'm looking forward to visiting as a parent uh, next year um, and possibly volunteering. Thank you so much. Thank you, and I will toss it to Vice Chair because I have a comment, um, uh, Superintendent House. One of the things that I've, I've been an advocate in this county for a long time, and I believe this is the first time, genuinely, that the administration heard. You, you can see people, but you heard the people, especially when you did your first town halls and the ones that I observed most of those parents talked about autism, their children, what school should they go to. You heard them. And then I was here with Point of Ridge for about a year and a half. All I am saying is a new pair of eyes, you heard them. Thank you so much. 
I, I appreciate that at a personal level. So I just want to say that publicly. Now, uh, may we have the roll call for the vote? Mrs. Adam Stafford? Ms. Buda Strada? Aye. Mr. Briggs? Aye. Dr. Harris? Aye. Mr. Jackson? Aye. Mrs. Asaya Frazier? Aye. Dr. J. Miller? Dr. Z. Miller? Aye. Mrs. Rao? Aye. Ms. Walker? Aye. Ms. Rivera Forbes? Aye. Ms. Mickens Barry? Ten. I mean, aye. <laughs> I have the number right this time. It's 10 in the affirmative and zero in the negative. The motion uh, carries. It's approved. Thank you so much. Uh, Follow-up items from the board meetings will be posted on board docs upon receipt. And before we adjourn, the uh, student board member, Ms. Rivera Forbes, has asked for a, a moment of personal privilege. Good evening, everyone. My name is Rain Rivera Forbes, and I have the amazing opportunity to serve as the 43rd student member of the Prince George's County Board of Education. And I have been working very closely with my small advisory council to plan an event that will highlight not only just some of our students in the county, but every single student in Prince George's County, and we are calling it International Night. International Night is going to be an opportunity for every single student, no matter their background or culture, to be highlighted in the form of performances, spoken word, poetry, art, student vendors, anything you can think of, you name it. They are going to be there being showcased and highlighted for our diversity in our county. And this event is going to take place on January 19th, 2024 at Fairmont Heights High School. It's from 6 o'clock p.m. to 8.30 p.m. And to sign up, you can go on the PGCPS underscore SAC Instagram page. And in our bio, you will see the link, but I will also read it here for you as well. It is lowercase t-i-n-y-u-r-l dot com slash 4SM4NECT. And that is all lowercase. Again, this is open to the Prince George's County community, especially the Prince George's County Public School students. It's a free event, and I would love to see you all there to showcase and highlight our students. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. And please, let's support our student board member and her smile. At this time, we will have a motion to confirm items taken in executive session on January 11, 2024. The chair recognizes Vice Chair Walker. I move to confirm the actions taken in the executive session, which were to receive a report from the superintendent, to discuss approved personnel matters, to receive a report from internal and external audit, to receive legal advice. Second. Okay, it has been moved and properly seconded. Any discussion? Seeing none, Ms. Adeline, please take the roll. Ms. Adam Stafford. Ms. Buda Struthers? Aye. Mr. Briggs? Aye. Dr. Harris? Aye. Mr. Jackson? Aye. Ms. Lasaya Fraser? Aye. Dr. J. Miller? Dr. Z. Miller? Aye. Mrs. Rout? Aye. Ms. Walker? Aye. Ms. Rivera Forbes? Aye. Mrs. McInsbury? Aye. The uh, vote is 10 in the affirmative, 0 in the negative. The motion carries. Motion to adjourn. Second. Second. I said motion to adjourn. Uh oh, okay. <laughs> I was that was going there next. <laughs> it has been moved properly seconded to adjourn. Any discussion? Thank you all and good night. Thank you. Oh, do I have to vote? Do, do raise your hands. Raise your hands, board members. Ten. Ten in the affirmative, zero in the negative. God. <laughs> this was something. Everybody's gone. <laughs>